Hi guys, I'm Lena. Welcome to my All Analog Photography channel. This is the second video in a series about choosing film based on the technical descriptions from data sheets while understanding what they actually mean. In the previous video, we discovered the world of spectral sensitization. If you have not watched it yet, here is the link. Now we will look at the film emulsions in terms of speed and grain type. There are two general types of emulsions in terms of crystal shape. Classical grain emulsions based on the recipes from the 50s and modern tabular grain emulsions with first patents filed in the 80s. Both types can be either regular crystals or core shell. The only currently existing tab grain emulsions are Kodak T-Max, Ilford Delta, Fuji Acros and the Foma Pen 200 film. Every single other black and white film has classical grain. Most, if not all, color films are tab grain. To understand the differences between them, we start with the film ISO. That's quite easy and everyone knows, unlike the f-stop, the higher the number, the higher the sensitivity. 100 ISO is more sensitive than 20 and 3200 catches more light than 400. But how exactly is a film made more sensitive? The determining factor is the grain size. The larger the surface of an individual silver halide, the easier it gets hit by light. That's logical. Another factor is the spectral sensitization we already talked about. Obviously, if the film can capture more colors, it also performs more efficiently. This is why most 400 plus ISO films are fully panchromatic, sensitive up to 700 nanometers. It can be a gain of a third of a stop, but it's not nothing. The third factor is the chemical treatment of the crystals during production to make them less stable. A very disturbed silver halide needs much less light to become developable. The downside is a highly sensitive emulsion is more prone to fogging and has in general a shorter lifespan. Grain size is still the main factor, everything else giving only up to one stop in sensitivity. There is simply no way to make a super fine grain and super high speed film, otherwise everyone would be doing it. The search for the holy grail, a small grain yet highly sensitive film, has been going on for years. And it went two ways, in the core shell and tabular directions. Funnily enough, they were introduced almost at the same time, both Kodak with tab grain and Fuji with their core shell, claiming they made an absolute revolution in film manufacturing. And indeed, both technologies were quite life-changing. So let's first look at the tabular grain. Here goes a little side story. Now, knowing how much non-proven, barely scientific information about analog photography is out there, I never ever ever trust anything until I confirm it with at least uh, two sources, preferably one of them being published. But there were days when I simply trusted anyone with a cool-looking analog camera and a beard. So, until quite recently, I firmly believed the myth uh, that um, Kodak T-Max films are called T-grain because the grains are shaped like tiny T letters. I might have even passed this knowledge to other people and that's pretty embarrassing and I'm sorry if you were among those. Anyway, the truth is Kodak simply patented the term T-grain, but it stands for tabular grain, which is in case of T-Max, Delta Acros and Foam Fan 200, the same concept. By definition, tabular grain is very flat with a surface to thickness ratio of two and higher, latest ones from Fuji being 18 times thinner than their surface. All those crystals are tabular grains. Because of their shape, they slide on top of each other, parallel to the film base, leaving no gaps in between. The smoother appearing surface gives bigger enlargement possibilities with pretty much almost no apparent grain. An ISO 100 tab grain emulsion will produce images with the graininess of a 50 ISO classical film. Tab grain films, because of the crystals covering the base very well, need less silver to achieve a D-max depth of blacks comparable to classical emulsions, so they need much less silver to be produced. They also absorb sensitizing dyes better, so overall the film costs less to be made, so it's really great for manufacturers. 
To be called a tabula grain, a film has to have at least 50% of such flat crystals. All emulsions which use some, but less than half, are considered to be cubic grain and traditional. The latest codec patents already talk about over 90% consistently sized tabular grains. So, are T-Max Delta Acros and Foma Pen 200 same? Yes and no. Kodak started implementing T grains and filing for patents in the very early 1980s, introducing a black and white T grain film T Max in 1986. For many years, this emulsion, the only one of its kind, remained controversial because of handling limitations, but clear superiority in grain sharpness and resolution. But before comparing it to Delta films, we should also talk about the core shell technology. It came out under the double-structured grain name, introduced by Fuji in 1983 for color photography. This technology is, in essence, the following. An outer shell of, for example, silver bromide, uh, which is surrounding a tiny grain of silver iodide. The outside shell, it's big, it has a big surface, it catches the light more efficiently, but what is mainly developed is the small grain inside, so the image is more fine-grained. So smart! By the 90s, pretty much every photo manufacturer had either a tab grain or tab grain plus core shell color film, because color was the market of growth and competition. Black and white films somehow dragged behind. Kodak produced the only black and white tabula grain film until finally Ilford released Delta 400, the direct competitor or the only friend to T-Max. Trying to compensate for T-Max's downsides, especially the elevated contrast and easily blown highlights, the Delta 400 crystals had, quote, carefully tailored sensitometric properties to ensure maximum details captured in highlight and shadows, which means the film is much more flat, whatever you do to it. But the interesting part was that Ilford trademarked the word core shell, by the way, if you talk of the technology itself, it's core slash shell but went beyond the simple two-layer structure, pimping their crystals to four layers, each playing a part in the capturing of light and development characteristics. Slightly later came Foma Pen 200, which, unexpectedly, the first and last of all Foma films combined both core shell and tabula grain technologies. But as you already know, there are tab grains and tab grains. Some are slim, elegant, and have a lot of technology behind. Some are quite clumsy, but still they fit the definition. And we also don't know whether Formapan has a simple core shell technology or is at Ilford level with those several layers. However, at least they are explicit, because the Kodak, and especially Fuji cases, are quite mysterious. Kodak has always focused on the shape, uniformity, and flatness of the crystals. All the publications and patents were just about that. Here is how a Kodak T-Max film looks from the first type grain crystals to the newer ones. I found one source which claims that some of the T-Max grains are core shell, but I guess not all, or it's not a central feature. For sure, we're not talking about more than two crystal layers. Fuji Acros is a more difficult case. No, what am I saying? Fuji is cryptic about what they do. I hate so much those fancy marketing names that can mean literally anything. I have been digging for hours through Fuji research papers and patents, but they were never explicit, always talking about their Sigma crystal technology, which takes various forms. Since this video is about black and white films, we're mostly interested in Neopan Acros 100. It has always been labeled as tab grain by people on the forums, and I kind of blindly believe this. But let's not do it and look into what Fuji are saying themselves. Spoiler, not much. The only thing they say is that Acros is made with a super fine Sigma grain technology. Nowhere I could find an explicit claim that all crystals called Sigma are flat. For example, the uniform Sigma crystal technology from 1994 creates an emulsion with both flat and cubic grains. That's what they say. However, going through all the later Fuji color film research papers and data sheets, whenever the grains were called Sigma, they were flat. In fact, Fuji was dedicating a lot of research to making those crystals thinner and more efficient. 
those are the epitaxial uh, sigma crystals just look how amazingly sophisticated and fine structured sigma grain and super nano structured sigma grain so if acros is labeled as super fine sigma grain i guess it's a tabular emulsion too. Hello from my future self who is sitting here editing this video. I did find how the superfine sigma crystals look like in a report written in Japanese by Fuji. Those grains are tabular. And then I asked myself, are sigma crystals coarse shell? Uh, here again, no direct confirmation. What I can almost surely claim is that 1983 core shell technology is pretty much how all modern emulsions are made and it would be weird if those who introduced it wouldn't use it however delta core shell as we remember is extra sophisticated is acros same likely not fuji neopan acros 100 was introduced in 2002 and the so-called multi-structured crystals those which look like delta grains were presented to the public only a year later. Now, classical grain. It's not smooth like the tabular one. It's a mess. You have all imaginable shapes happily floating in gelatin. You need more silver to generate more crystals and have them in a thicker layer to minimize this in-between space and cover the film base. Visually, this beautifully chaotic emulsion produces a true vintage look. The images are less flat, more airy, and have this authentic film feel. Here among classical films, I absolutely have to mention Ilford HP5, probably the best mass market emulsion ever made. It's ridiculously forgiving, has a true film look, fantastic for any kinds of experimentation with developers. I don't shoot it because way too many people use it, but I can't not admit how great it is. Since we're at it, let's address forgivingness, also known as latitude. In human language, it means how much you can mess up your exposure and development and still get a decent quality image. Side note, don't forget, this is a video of guidelines for beginners. At advanced levels of photographic practice, you look at whether the range of tones of a specific scene fits the latitude of your film and then adjust the exposure and development accordingly, if necessary. But right now, we focus on the fact that the crystal shape tends to affect the latitude too. I've encountered various opinions online, many of which being that after proper exposure and perfectly matched developer, the latitude of the T grain films is by no means inferior to classical ones. But yeah, people saying this are usually quite experienced to an extent when they forget how it felt to be a beginner. Ilford, when introducing Delta 400, explicitly said it was a film for professional shooters who photograph in controlled conditions. From the experience with my students, I've seen remarkably badly exposed and processed HP5 and FP4 films, which still produced printable negatives. But whenever an exposure on Delta 100 is missed, it's trash. I mean, okay, one stop error, okay, but overall it's not a film for playing around uh t max is slightly better in that sense but also not super flexible foma claims that foma pen creative has tabular grains and a wide latitude which just leads me to think that this emulsion is a mix of both flat and cubic grains and maybe cubic ones are quite a big part i have also some other reasons to think so so the last big difference between the two emulsions. If you want to experiment with different developers, classical films will give you more varied results. You can really dramatically modify the look of the film by switching from ID11 to um, HC110 to Rodinal. The T-grain films are designed to respond significantly less to variations in development. I found confirmation to this in several Kodak patents and in the Fuji Acros 100 descriptions. Now to sum it all up. At the same ISO, with the same subject, same developer, a tabular grain film will give results which are less grainy, sharper, which we did not really talk super much about, but it is their feature mentioned in all the patents. And classical film will have airy, more pronounced grain, but inferior sharpness. However, a tab grain film will be much less forgiving and less suitable for beginners, while a classical emulsion will be the best friend of those who occasionally mess up 
than exposure because it is more forgiving and has a higher latitude. Responding to developers, a top grain film will show less difference with varying developers, but will be sensitive to processing mistakes and will need longer fixing times due to the crystal shapes. And a classical emulsion will give a stronger response to different developers and more creative possibilities and will of course need shorter fixing times and it will have more tolerance to processing mistakes. The tab grain film will stay good for longer because the thin flat grains absorb less radiation and don't fog too easy, while a classical emulsion will age quicker and fog easier because every single shape behaves differently. For example, rod-shaped grains even randomly self-develop. There are other differences. We could talk more about better emulsion optics resulting in better sharpness or this radiation sensitivity, but if you don't want me to go on forever, I should stop right here. I think this is enough for today and I'm looking forward to the next video where we will look a little more into contrast and sharpness. Sharpness is quite objective, but I still don't know how to approach uh, the contrast topic because uh, it's so heavily depends on the developer choice. So I'm off to think about that and you guys have fun researching more about the films. Make sure to follow me on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok and see you in the next video. Bye!